What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Wrestling with Jonas. This is episode 113, and this is a special interview with Jonas episode. And uh, this is in conjunction with IWE UK. Uh, so this is the fourth Wrestling with Jonas interview in partnership with the Essex-based brand IWE UK. And uh, you may have previously listened to my interviews with Xander, Maverick Blade, Kevin Isaac. Uh, but now I want to introduce to you one half of the IWE Tag Team Champions. He's the Urban Goth. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome to you Frankie T. So, uh, Frankie, good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Wrestling With Jonas podcast. Are you well, sir? Good afternoon. I'm absolutely fantastic, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. No, you're very, very welcome. And it's been a long time in coming. Like I say, we've had uh, three of our interviews before yourself with, with Xander and with Kevin and Maverick Blade, of course. And uh, they were really well received interviews. And I'm really honoured to have you on the Wrestling With Jonas podcast. And uh, like I say, we've been messaging backwards and forwards. And it's, it's finally great to have you on the podcast. But before we kind of get stuck into your your wrestling career, then, Frankie, I want to talk about kind of the hot topic that's on everybody's doorstep at the moment and that's of course the coronavirus now we're all getting used to uh, and having to adopt uh, you know a- a- adapt to the ever-changing world that is the coronavirus epidemic that is placing upon us and you, you know one of which is the fact that sporting events and sporting franchises all over the world uh, are having to close up shop and uh, you know at least until we got this thing under control frankie uh, you know alongside this we're all aware that it's the effects it's having on professional wrestling and uh, no more so than the the uk indie wrestling scene at the moment which you're a big part of now you were meant to have had a wrestling match for phoenix wrestling association over the weekend in a match against longtime rival uh, tommy diamonds in their march madness show it was meant to be a ladder match for the pwa champion Am I right in thinking that that match had to be cancelled because of the virus, Frankie? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, it's quite um, worrying when you put the telly on and you, you see all this um, uh, mayhem going on surrounding the, the COVID-19 yeah. and the effect it's having on people. Um, the the show itself did have to be cancelled, you, you know, uh, Public health and safety comes first and foremost, as does the workers, the wrestlers. Yeah, of course. Um, but I believe it has all the show has been rescheduled for June. But yeah, it's it's one match I was looking forward to really. Um, the COVID nineteen's taking its toll on the uh, the independent scene. There's a lot of people going out of work, and the public health and safety, you know, is paramount at the moment. Um, comes first and foremost um, but you know it's not all doom and gloom there's a couple of shows recently that have had behind closed uh, behind closed door shows that have received had pretty good reception actually um, one that I think of recently is uh, WAW um, they broadcast a, a show via YouTube I believe um, that was very warmly welcomed, and it, you know, people have dealt, or, or from my area have, have just non stop spoken about it. Yeah, yeah. But um, a lot of indie promotions, you know, are having to put a halt on things, really. And, you know, with, with Phoenix, um, with PWA, of course, we mentioned that. And I'm guessing most of the other promotions you tend to wrestle for are having to you know, uh, kind of suspend their their performances for the foreseeable future. Um, has that certainly been your experience of it? And I'm guessing with, with IWE, kind of plans are up in the air at the moment, not knowing when things are going to get back to normal. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's quite frustrating. Um, obviously, I had the PWA booking, the Phoenix Wrestling Association, the, the ladder match for Tommy Diamond, these things can't be helped, you know, uh, public health and safety and the safety of the wrestlers and everyone else involved is, you know, first and foremost, really. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll get out of the doom and gloom and we'll talk about a more positive subject. And that's kind of uh, pro wrestling. Um, and certainly when you first started getting into pro wrestling as a fan. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested to know um, 
when did your wrestling kind of your love for pro wrestling start as a fan? I mean, have you been a lifelong wrestling fan, uh, Frankie? And, and can can you remember when you first uh, fell in love with pro wrestling? Can you remember from an early age uh, what kind of really drew you in as a fan to pro wrestling? This will probably give away how old I actually am. <laughs> um, so I remember going to a friend's house one one night um, from school. Uh, I was probably about 10 years old. Uh, it's probably going back to 1994. Um, my friend's dad had popped on. Uh, this was back when it was WWF. Uh, it was a show called Mania. Yeah. Uh, it was hosted by uh, Todd Pettingale. And it was literally after about a couple of minutes, I was like, this is really cool. Um, you know, like most kids find something they attach themselves to. Wrestling for me and that show in particular just lit a fire in me. And I was like, I need to watch more of this. I need to watch more of this. And it sort of progressed from there. Um, sort of like watching Mania. Then I discovered Monday Night Raw or Raw is War. Yeah. And it just elevated from there to the point where it just wasn't enough that I started watching WCW. Um, I think for a brief period when I was allowed at the time, it was ECW as well. And yeah, it's just literally, I've still got under my stairs some, because I used to tape it on VHS and I've still got quite a few there. Yeah, and it, it's probably part of a collection that you'll never get rid of, to be honest with you. I mean, I've got some VHS, uh, you know, recordings and some original WWF Silver Vision tapes from uh, uh, from back in the day. And, you know, although I probably never get to see them again because I don't think I own a VHS or ever get to own one again. It's just part of a collection. It's part of the part of the kind of nostalgia and the love for wrestling that we had back then. But to me, when you were you know, describing Mania and Raw is War, you know, there was a lot of larger-than-life, really colourful characters back then. I mean, who were some of the characters that really kind of captivated you and uh, uh, brought you into the world of pro wrestling as a fan? Who were some of the, the wrestlers or characters that really caught your attention back then? I think the the the, the, the first... Um, it wasn't a solo wrestler that drew me in, it was a tag team. And... I think they were very, very underrated, and that was the Bushwhackers. Ah, okay. So it was it's just the crazy, the arm swinging, the camo trousers and the vest, and it was just really caught my eye. And it was just something different about those. And then as I got older, it sort of moved towards um, Brett the Hitman Hart, Tatanka, um, big boss man. Yeah, many of the same wrestlers I used to watch and enjoy watching uh, back in the day. Um, but uh, th- that's really fascinating to hear about your kind of your love for wrestling at such a young age. And then, I mean, have you always followed pro wrestling? I mean, was there a time when you kind of stopped watching it, um, or ha- how did your kind of your wrestling fandom change or develop over the years? Um, I've always followed it. Um, I used to watch it religiously and there was a period, I can't remember what caused it or what had happened, I really can't remember, but I'd stopped watching it, but I followed it via sort of like magazines and um, reviews, online reviews, and I'd watch like little clips that you see on I used to be sent little like videos of oh you need to check this bit out you need to check that bit out and then probably I want to say about 13 years ago I was sort of like got back into watching it full time and I'll say full time as if it's a job yeah. um but yeah I got back, back into watching it and sort of the next um, generation of wrestlers came were coming through, sort of like um, the Hardy Boys were coming through, uh, the Dudley Boys, uh, Gregory Helms. Those were the next um, the next set of wrestlers that really caught my eye. 
Oh, what about nowadays in Frank? I mean, what sort of, I mean, you're obviously heavily involved as a wrestler yourself, which we'll get more uh, into as the interview progresses. But what sort of wrestling do you like to watch either, you know, from the comfort of your own living room or when you have a chance to go and view it as a, as a spectator, as a fan? What sort of wrestling kind of really, uh, you know, really captivates you nowadays then? Um, well, I'm a family man now. I've got a young family, so I've actually got to knock all the extreme stuff, um, CZW and um, everything like that on the head and just yeah. watching my spare time, really. Um, a lot of what, I watch a lot of the uh, current um, WWE, uh, All Elite Wrestling, um, just stuff really that I've, I've, I think suitable that my my children could sit down and you know we could watch it together. Yeah, yeah, and, and much the same as me. Um, like I say, a, a, a tastes change over the years. I mean, I'm very much an NXT guy. Um, I, I'm a diehard WWE guy, regardless of uh, you know what what happens or uh, what's said about the promotion. And AEW has really drew me in as well. Absolutely love watching AEW. So uh, some, some good stuff there. Uh, but um, before you started your wrestling career, Frankie, were there any any sports that you were into? Were you, were you particularly sporty, or um, would you consider yourself a natural athlete? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I've I've seen quite a few clips of you on on Instagram. You seem to be quite naturally athletic. Um, but uh, besides wrestling, are you into any other sports? Um, growing up, I was always into football. Um, I tried other sports, uh, hockey, rugby, uh, tennis. But yeah, I, I, sort of apart from football, I really got into baseball at one point. Um, didn't really follow it as a sport. I just enjoyed playing it. Yeah. Um, and I used to do a lot of, of um, long distance running. Uh, I used to do quite a f- in senior school when you do your sports days. I always did the fifteen hundred meters. Uh, you were always the long distance man, were you? Yeah, oh yeah. If you're going to do it, do it properly. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But um, and, and like I say, you know, it shows in your wrestling style that you are quite a, a natural athlete. So I kind of figured there might be some sort of sporting background there. But uh, let's talk about pro wrestling then. Let's talk about uh, you when, when you first started training and getting into training to become a pro wrestler. Um, when did you first kind of get the desire to want to become a pro wrestler? Is it something you've always wanted to do? And when, when did kind of the, you have the light bulb moment, Frankie, and think, right, today is the day when I'm going to, you know, sign up to start um, as a pro wrestler to start training? And did you kind of try to seek out a wrestling school? Tell us about that, that thought process at the time. Um, well, from the moment that I started watching it at my friend's house, um, I literally at that point, this is what I want to do when I grow up. Didn't matter what I, what else was there. That was my focus. That's what I wanted to do. And um, but yeah, back then trying to find a, a school was for me was quite difficult because uh, although I was playing a lot of sports, I wasn't a very out outgoing person. I suppose. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was sort of from 10, 10 years old, and then when I hit 17, 18, sorry, I just moved out of uh, my parents' house into the city, and I see this flyer up on uh, a telephone box for uh, FWA. Um, so I gave them a call and went down and... and uh, uh, had a chat with Mark Stone, who was the promoter there. And yeah, just from that moment there, I used to go down every Wednesday. Um, you had the likes of uh, Andy Boy Simmons there. Occasionally, I'd, I'd see Johnny Storm there. And it was just a fan- fantastic for me. You've got these well-experienced guys there, and I'm learning from the from these guys. And it just propelled me more. It's just quite mesmerising watching all these future stars back then who are major stars now sort of lit an even bigger fire in me just to make this a possibility yeah so 
how many years ago did you did you start training then, uh, Frankie? Was it um, because I mean, going back through you know your your social media and everything, I can only see something uh, stuff from the last few, uh, three or four years. But um, uh, have you been training longer than that? Um, yeah, sort of. Like, I've I've made a real go of this over the last couple of years. Yeah, um, I've trained. Um, I was I started for FWA. I had a few perfect going on in my life at the time and I ended yeah. up just uh, knocking it on the head and I ended up moving up to Yorkshire. Um, my partner um, was pregnant and she wanted to be closer to her family so we ended up moving to Yorkshire and I was up there for a couple of years and um, my boy and it was probably, I want to say, about seven years yeah. since I then stepped into, I found another uh, training school in Revolution Pro Wrestling. Um, so I went along there, which is run by Andy Boy Simmons and Andy Quilden, who are two fantastic trainers. They're doing a fantastic job down there, even to this day. So yeah, I, was, I went to uh, Rev Pro and I was there for I was training in there for just under two years, I think. Um, and made uh, Rev Pro in a, one of their Rumble matches. Yeah. Um, which was my last. Um, again, personal life got in the way and. I ended up um, stepping away a couple of men, and then I found a local power wrestling. Yeah. Uh, which is run by um, Carlos. Again, another great wrestler who sits under the radar. Such um, and then from there, sort of like you make you make I made a few connections, and before I knew it, I was not only. In Portsmouth, I was in Southampton, and via Southampton, I was up in uh, sort of Somerset area. As a result of that, I got to uh, Leamington Spa, I have got to Essex, I have got to Wales, and it's just been quite an emotional roller coaster, really, looking back on it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, wh- when did you make your your pro wrestling debut then? So, you, so you were training for a little while. Um, and then you finally stepped foot inside the ring. So where did that happen? Uh, which, which promotion was it for? Who was it against? Tell us about that experience of, of finally making your pro wrestling debut. I mean, when I've spoken to other wrestlers in the past about their debut, they've been uh, they, they explained how they were quite nervous, quite apprehensive. Uh, but at the end of it, they were kind of absolutely buzzing, really enjoyed the experience. Tell us a bit about your experience of that first match. So. So my first time stepping in the ring on a live show was um, a pro and they do like a, every January like an annual Revolution Rumble and I made my debut for them. I came out at number 21 and um, it was quite it was quite a weird feeling because I was absolutely buzzing. I was nervous because I had a load of friends in the crowd. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is going to be absolutely brilliant. Then at one minute I'm like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to look stupid. And the buzzer went off. I walked out, just a huge cheer from everyone. And I'm like, whoa, what's this is sort of like euphoria? Yeah. And um, didn't last very long. Um, probably the whole of ten seconds, which is, uh, you know. It's not ideal, but but it's, you know it's a show. You put on a show. The crowd were entertained by it. But yeah, from that that really dr- drove me to uh, you know I, I want to do. I want more of this. I want more. I want more. Despite yeah. that, ten oh, it's only ten seconds. And it's just that buzz would never go away. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I say, it, it's kind of that adrenaline rush and you've got that you know massive adrenaline after the match is why it probably took you hours to kind of uh, get out of your system um but then i suppose you know you you were steadily having matches after that 
Um, now, tell us about some of the promotions that you worked for fairly early on, because I've got down here that you worked for uh, CWP, uh, KWE and Kapow Wrestling, amongst others. Uh, tell us about some of them early promotions you used to wrestle for and some of your experiences there and how valuable it was to you uh, that those promotions, you know, gave you bookings, gave you an opportunity uh, to help you kind of develop your wrestling career, essentially. So after I left Revolution Pro Wrestling um, and dealt with the personal issues or the personal side of life um, at that particular time, I went training to uh, Kapow Wrestling. Yeah. And whilst training there, there was someone I've become, I've become friends with, a company in just outside of Southampton called KWE, uh, Knockout Wrestling Entertainment. Um, and after training with Kapow for a little while, he said, you know, I, I run this show, come on over, have, have a match with us. And it was my first singles match. Um, and I was like, yeah, okay, not quite sure. I've done rumbles before, and it's like, am I ready for it? Um, and oddly enough, my first singles match was against Maverick Blade. Um, fantastic wrestler and a really good uh, friend of mine. So I had that match, had a couple of matches um, back at Capel. Mainly multi-man match. This the secret of that by accident. I'd actually messaged uh, the promoter thinking he was someone else, um, which was a funny story. But yeah, I said to him, oh, "Are you?" Um, I can't remember what, what I thought I called him now. But I said to him, oh, "Are you this person?" He said, "No, no, I'm this person, and I run this company." And I said, "Oh, okay." And uh, we got chatting, and he, he invited me down, and. Um, had a couple of matches with CWP and are still to this day. Um, really, because uh, um, who runs CWP, fantastic job he's doing there. Um, it's a charity-based show and all the money raised goes to a different charity. Um, and it's just such a, it's just such a nice thing that someone's doing these shows and giving something back. Yeah, so for anybody that follows you on Instagram would have seen clips of you training in November 2016 and uh, you know, they would have seen the very quick progressive progression that you were making as a pro wrestler in them training clips, especially if you practice in some high spots. Did, did that sort of training come naturally to you and did you have to push yourself to try new things like that and really take yourself out of, the, out of your comfort zone so you were doing some flips and some moon salts were they new moves to you that you, that you were practicing and kind of really trying to uh, develop your style at that time uh basically um, and at that point i think that was a kapow and they said oh is there anything that anyone wants to so i want to do a moon salt so they they told me what to do and i just it straight off the bat and um it just it just kind of went from there really it's sort of like i want to do this i'm going to give it a go and if i can't do it and then the first three attempts i'll look for something else <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Let, let's talk a bit more about kapow and kwe um, and uh, CWP, you know, throughout your early stages, and we're talking 2017 now, going back over your Instagram, there, there are clips of matches with you against Maverick Blade, as you mentioned, Johnny Royal as well. Uh, these are a couple of individuals that you would create quite a bond with. And uh, soon uh, afterwards, you know, you'd obviously create IWE UK together. Uh, tell us about, you know, the, the friendship and the relationship you have with uh, Maverick and Johnny Royal. <clears throat> Maverick Blade and Johnny Royal are really, really good friends of mine. Um, I've got a lot of time in the world for those two. Um, there's certain people in life that you, you talk to and you get that instant bond. Um, and just backstage alone, just talk to those guys, we all sort of clicked. Uh, John and uh, Brooking, or Maverick Blade, sorry, were friends beforehand, before I came along. And, um, you know, I'd, they'd been wrestling uh, quite a while before me and they were very helpful, uh, giving me advice 
um, give me pointers, and I'd always be grateful for those two. Yeah, and, and like I say, you obviously uh, bonded uh, you know very well with those two individuals to the point where you know the three of you came up with the concept of IWE UK, which we'll talk about more in a moment. But uh, before we talk about IWE, let's talk about your gimmick then, Frankie. So the urban goth. Uh, where did the gimmick come from? Was it influenced by your, your love for a particular style of music? Um, and how much of the real life Frankie is part of that gimmick? So they say in wrestling, um, your gimmick should be like an extension of yourself. Um, I mean, growing up, I was always um, sort of like black nail varnish and baggy trousers and the banded T-shirts. And... Um, Although I'm a family man now, that that love for that scene hasn't gone away. Yeah. And wrestling, sort of, I can bring that that um, that attitude back and express myself that way. Um, but yeah, sort of like I try and be myself. On that same subject, then, Frankie. So only last month. Uh, you took to social media, I think Instagram in particular, uh, and you put out a very passionate post aimed at some negativity you, you know, you've you received about your gimmick. Um, the, the post appears to be a, a bit of an anti-bullying post from yourself. Um, a, anyone who hasn't read it, I really urge you to go and visit Frankie T's Instagram page and have a read of it. It's, it's a fantastic post from Frankie. But give us a bit of insight towards your comments in that post and uh, what kind of inspired you to put out that post like i say it's a very uh anti-bullying message from yourself but uh, give us a bit of insight into you know the, the background to that post uh, please frankie okay so a friend of mine <clears throat> um had put a post up on facebook who's you know, he's a good up and coming wrestler and he's after some advice in regards to wrestling CVs. You know, do wrestling promoters actually read the CVs or do they just look for something else? Yeah. And um, obviously this was this was only a few months ago and I just left a comment saying that I as a promoter I read everything and I look at everything that you've got to offer. Yeah. And a a, com- a a company had commented on there with it wasn't uh, naming me, but it was aimed at me. Yeah. Um, because of my gimmick, it's very Undertakerish. And I just thought to myself, I'm not I'm not one for naming names, naming and shaming. I'm not going to do that here. Um, but I didn't take it very well. And I thought to myself, how can I respond to this without naming and shaming and also try and encourage other people to try to be creative and express themselves, which is what we was all told in training, you know, make your, your wrestling character an extension of yourself. And, but yeah, I just sort of look, sort of like looking back on the years, I have had some um some negativity in, in regards to um my wrestling gimmick and i just thought well i'm gonna have to come out and say something and make it meaningful and you know don't be ashamed of what, what works for you yeah yeah absolutely it's, uh, it, it's a very inspiring piece to be honest with you and uh you know a, a very passionate um bit of writing as well and I think it definitely got the message across. And uh, yeah, so so well done for that, my friend. I mean, that's, that's a, an excellent piece. But uh, speaking of that and speaking of what an inspiration uh, you are to, to kids and to families, it's very clear from anybody that's seen you, Frankie, that, uh, you know, during and uh, after matches, you're very popular with the fans. You're definitely a fan favourite, very popular with the kids and with the families. Um, you obviously take a lot of pride in being a baby face. But what does the fan support mean to you, especially during matches? Um, well, I, I just like to entertain people, really. Um, I've, I've tried being a hill before um, and that hasn't it's never worked. So 
you know, being babyface and being able to put a um, smile on, on people's faces or, you know, it's whether you make them cheer, boo, laugh, yeah. you're, you're getting that um, reaction. And it's a reaction that they're going to take away with them. And it's always going to be a good memory for them, the fans, sorry. Um, but, yeah, it just sort of, like, drives me on. I just like seeing people smile. Um, I, as I come to the ring, I normally have, like, an extra flashy neon hat that I've got or a T-shirt, and I'll hand it out to a child in the crowd. And just seeing his face light up just makes it all worth it for me. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really, really cool. And um, let's let's uh, flip it slightly and talk a bit about your your wrestling style then. So from what I've seen of you, Frankie, you definitely go you know full throttle in all of your matches. You appear to you know wrestle with a mix of high flying. There's a few very convincing submission moves thrown in there as well for good measure. How would you describe your your kind of wrestling style then, Frankie? And was it influenced by you know any of your wrestling heroes or anybody that you know in the business? So the submission side of me sort of it stems from sort of like Brett the Hitman Hart and CM Punk. Um, really, um, they're the two that stand out for me in terms of submission moves. Um, as a kid, I'd always used to put my brother in submission moves, and he'd, he'd hate it. And um, <laughs> well, if you've never put your brother in, in a sharpshooter, are you even related? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But, um, yeah, the high-flying side of me, I sort of, like, look at the likes of um, uh, Taka Michinuku, um, Jeff Hardy, you know, again, Gregory Helms. I've got a lot of love for Gregory Helms. Um, the guy's got it all, really. Submissions, the high-flying, you know, the, the power. Yeah. But, yeah, I, it's, I suppose sort of, like, those... Those types of wrestlers, you know, I look to them for inspiration, you know, try and take my own twist on things. Yeah, it definitely shows as well. It really does definitely show. And you, you've got quite a versatile style in the ring. and You're not afraid to take the match to the outside and, you know, go a little bit, uh, you know, street fight or hardcore on the outside. But um, you're very versatile as a wrestler. And I think that really shows um, in, in your matches, most definitely. But flipping it again slightly i mean i've even seen that you've done some mma training frankie you've even <laughs> had a match inside an mma ring what prompted you to take a step into mma then i mean obviously you know mma and uh, being a combat sport has always had links over the years with professional wrestling um you know is it something you've always had you your eye on doing uh, tell us about that experience and i know that you did have a, a match inside a, an mma cage as well so every year I like to do something for charity. I like to give something back. Um, you know, I, I ask for nothing. I don't expect anything out of life. But I like to do my little bit to give something back to the charities. You know, they all do a fantastic, uh, fantastic job in helping everyone. And, and that particular year, a friend of mine, Chuck Cyrus, he... Um, He'd done some white collar boxing um, a few months prior. And I thought to myself, I want to do something different to that. And I saw the MMA one pop up and I thought, I'll give that a go. You know, it was free training, um, you know, raised money for, for Cancer Research UK. And it was just fantastic. It was it's a different type of buzz altogether. Just being in a cage, you know, like I had friends there to support. Um, I didn't win. For me, that was irrelevant because we raised, I think we raised £12,000 that night for cancer wow. research. That's impressive. That's really good. Um, but yeah, it's sort of like. <laughs> I'm not a fighter, and I'll let this out there now. I actually said to my opponent, you're going to have to hit me first because I ain't got it in me to hit you. Yeah. And he did not hold back. But, yeah, it's just absolutely phenomenal. I just 
I can't describe it. If, if you wanted to do, I always say to people, never be afraid to try something new, even if it's outside your comfort zone, because what you get back from it is just incredible. Yeah. Is it something you'd want to do again, Frankie? Um, well, I've spoken to a few friends of mine and it's on the cards for next year. And then that would be the final one. Yeah. Yeah. You can uh, hang up your MMA gloves and say you've uh, had at least two matches, eh? But uh, let's go back to something really close to your heart then, Frankie. Let's talk about IWE UK. So this is a promotion that you're heavily involved in. uh, And I'm sure you won't mind me saying on this podcast that, uh, uh, you know, IWE is very close to your heart. Um, and um, as we alluded to earlier, you're, you're one of the, the co-owners or one of the co-founders of IWE UK. Tell us about IWE and when you first decided to start up your very own wrestling promotion, Frankie. So the idea came about really um, when you're first starting out in wrestling and you're trying to branch out for, for bookings and experience. A lot of people I've spoke to, and I've had this myself, um, they kind, everyone was kind of using wrestlers closer to home and it was very hard to branch out and uh, it, you know it's quite frustrating and I was talking to um, excuse me I was talking to John and Brooke um, saying what if we ran a wrestling company that would only book people looking for experience doesn't matter where they're from, you know, just give them that foot in the door so they have the footage, the match experience, the live crowd, photos. They can add that to their CV and they can use it on their journey, sort of help them along their way. Yeah. And, you know, they were totally on board with me. But, yeah, they were totally on board with me. And we all just sat down and agreed, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Um, and then November 2018 was our first IWE show, and that was just incredible. Um, we had the likes of Xander was there. Um, we had Ian Frost. We had Charlie Biggs. We had names that I'd never heard of before. Um, and the turnout for that show was absolutely incredible. I think we had... 120 for the first show in the crowd that's impressive yeah and just to have all those people there cheering on everyone else gave them a boost so like we're we're not in it for ourselves we're just here to help everyone else out yeah we we just want to get people on their way and in our first year we had across four shows 36 debuts which i've never seen anyone give out that many opportunities or chances in one one year let alone four shows yeah that's quite impressive and considering it's only four shows as well um and as i mentioned earlier on in the podcast you know you you've been a bit of a a breeding ground for fresh new exciting up-and-coming talents and what you've just told me there clearly demonstrates that um, but uh, what, what sort of planning and organising goes into, you know, your your debut event for a brand new company? I mean, how, how did you know what to do? You know, did you have to do a lot of research or speak to other promoters? But how did you kind of tie up all the loose ends and get it to work for that first show? Uh, well, uh, I'd done a show uh, a couple of years before as like a one off fundraiser and John uh, I think kind of ran a company in Essex called KWA and we sort of um, put, our, put what we knew, what we thought we knew together and it just, it just worked because <laughs> uh, Brooking had to, had his own ring, which he allowed us to use. Yeah. And, um, sorry, excuse me. And, uh, so, yeah, so we all sat down. We just sort of like, right, OK, so this is going to be our budget. Um, we're going to have this many matches and whatever happens, happens. Yeah. You know, we're just going to get because we got actually when we started up the page and we put our first post out, 
saying, you know, are you struggling to get your name out there? Um, drop us a message. We're keen to work with you. The, the, the amount of messages we got was absolutely unbelievable. Um, I was, to the point I get about 20 messages a day from people asking, yeah. you know, is, are you still looking? Are you still looking? And it's like, yeah, send us your CVs. You know, let's see what you've got. We, we can try and work with you at some point. And what we've done for the first show, we picked out um, as many different uh, wrestling characters as we could without having the same. Yeah. And the whole show just clicked, and it was just, it was just something else. It was just, it's hard to hard to describe. It's like, um, what can I compare it to? Yeah. No, I suppose it's like a proud dad moment, I suppose you can call it. Yeah, really proud, I'm sure. Really proud and, uh, you know, excited for the future. And after having such a successful first show, it was kind of like, you know, you're off to the races then. And then uh, in February, I think you had your second show, uh, which was called Road to Glory, Frankie, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. And it was uh, an eight man tournament to crown the first ever IWE national champion. Now, you were part of that tournament. Now, um, I think you won't mind me saying that you got knocked out in the semifinal, but you did uh, kind of during that tournament have a, a really excellent match with uh, with Maverick, Maverick Blade. Uh, tell us about kind of th- that that tournament going out in the semi-finals, but more importantly, that match with Maverick, which was probably the match of the tournament. Um, thank you very much. I, I, for me personally, the match of the tournament was um, Zander versus Rob Sharp. Um, but I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, so me and um, Maverick Blade, you know, as I said, the sole focus isn't on myself, uh Maverick Blade or Johnny Royal, it's yeah. we're there for everyone else. And the the, the purpose of the tournament, because uh, we brought in Ash Draven and we brought in Rob Sharp, um, you know, as, as a thank you to the guys from the first show, um, you know, the first show we had qualifiers for the tournament and everyone had done such a fantastic job. The feedback was amazing. It's like, right, we need to do something for you guys because you guys did this. So we brought in, so everyone had an opportunity to wrestle, uh, you know, someone that's really out there. So what me and Brooke and jo- oh, Maverick Blade tried to do, sorry, is just a nice little opener, really. Yeah. What we tried to do um, a little bit of back and forth. Um, we, I, we did try and get a bit of a buzz going at that point. That I At that point, I'd never beaten Maverick Blade. And we'd wrestled a couple of times before. We tried to build a story on that, um, which I think worked pretty well. Um, so when I when I finally beat Maverick Blade, the the reception from the crowd was a really good one. It was, they were quite noisy. They were really behind everything, and it's it's just what you could ask for, really. Yeah. No, you definitely delivered. You really, really did. And like I say, you know, I might be a little bit biased because I've spoken to the two of you, but I definitely thought it was the match of the tournament and a great way to kick off that tournament. But uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, PWA then. So Phoenix Wrestling Association, um, you, you know, you're a former PWA tag team champion. Uh, more recently, though, um, you, you, you have become one half of the IWE tag team champions with uh, the goth daddy Xander. We've spoken a bit about Xander in this episode. We've interviewed you Xander on the first ever IWE UK interview now you were involved in a tournament to crown the first ever IWE tag team champions at the the gold diggers event in February so only last month um how special was that moment becoming the first ever tag team champions of IWE uh, with the very talented Xander and um you know so soon after he returned from his you know devastating injury that he suffered last year tell us about that moment of becoming uh, tag team champions alongside Xander I've got a lot of love for Sander. He's he's like a little brother to me. Um, and just, you know, just to share the moment with him of capturing the tag team championships. You know, it, it's you've done something together. You've worked hard um, as a team. Uh, you know what I mean? It's sort of like the final was the Bone Brothers, and they are some very powerful and very awesome looking as well. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, just, just to overcome the odds, really, because uh, in the first round we had Maverick Blade and Kit Knox, and again, Kit Knox should be, and the Bone Brothers should be further in their careers than where they are at the moment. They should yeah. be, they should be abroad, really traveling. That's how good they they are. Zander picking up the win for our team in both matches. In the second match, I had um, against the Bone Brothers. I, I had a bit of a uh, bit of an accident. Um, sort of, you touched um, that I do the moon salt and it's coming on quite well. So I went for a moon salt and as I bounced to rotate, my foot had slipped off the rope and I sort of like face planted the ring. And I just had to roll out on Zander. He is, Zander is something else. He, very quick thinking, you know, he doesn't miss a beat, saw what had happened and carried on the match by himself. But, um, you know, a and, and, uh, well-deserved victory, you know, both matches uh, really well won and then beating the Bone Brothers in the final, uh, picking up the gold. Um, it'll be a night to remember, I'm sure. But um, we spoke earlier about one of your fiercest rivals then, Tommy Diamonds. Now, you know, the match you were meant to have had with Tommy got cancelled over, over the weekend. We spoke about that at the top of the show. But, you have you know, you've had some really tremendous hard hitting matches with Tommy um, throughout, you know, the years with PWA. Uh, you had some really good matches. Would you say that Tommy Diamond is your probably your fiercest, probably your, your greatest rival to date then, Frankie? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Tommy is another one who you, you have people you, that you have that chemistry with. And Tommy Diamond is definitely up there. Um, not to sound big-headed, I don't think we've ever had a, a bad match between us. No. Um, so uh, I believe the one that was cancelled was the final match between us. Um, with one win apiece each, this was going to be the deciding one. Yeah. And I've had a ladder match before. It was a multi-man match, and this would have been my first singles ladder match, and I was really excited for this one. You know, it's sort of like recent events can't be helped. No. And, you know, health and safety of the public and everyone backstage is paramount. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure you'll get that kind of uh, blow off match between you and Tommy Diamond somewhere down the line. And I'm sure when it does happen, it will be, you know, even more better because you've had more time to build up the story and more build uh, more time to build up the anticipation. So I'll definitely be looking out for that one. But uh, um, looking at your your career um, to this point then. So you know, it's only a, 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 you know four or five years old, maybe, you know, around about that time span. But you've packed a lot into those years. And Frankie, what would you say were some of your proudest moments that's been part of your career up until now then? Proudest moments? Um, I think the proudest moment for me is, uh, apart from IWE, is I think up there is capturing the first the first title that I won, um, which was the tag team championship with uh, Phoenix Wrestling Association. That was quite special to me, yeah. um, especially at the time of year as well, because I just had a a loss in the family and it was my birthday. Right. So to win that was just at that particular moment in time. Just that was probably the greatest feeling I've ever had. Yeah. I don't know, it was just the whole experience really, I'm just proud of all of it. I've got no regrets in anything that I've done. Um, just the whole ride from start to where I am now. Yeah. I'm just proud of everything and, and everyone that I've met along the way, really. It's just sort of like everyone's been phenomenal, really supportive, encouraging. And yeah. those connections just bring the best out of you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been a hell of a ride so far for you, definitely. But um, going back to IWE, then, what what are some of your plans uh, that you have for the wrestling group for IWE, um, and, and where would you like to see the group? Where would you like to see IWE in the next couple of years? I mean, do do, do you have plans for growth, or do you have plans for uh, you know going bigger and better? Uh, what what can you tell me about IWE and your plans within the next couple of years? <sighs> Um, right, okay. So going forward, um, 
I've been in contact with two wrestling companies abroad, a bit like a work exchange program, uh, one being in Italy and one being in America. Um, so I, I can't, I suppose if you want to call that sort of branching out, yeah. expanding, um, that's in the pipeline. Um, again, that's just to help other people get themselves over, try something new in a different area. Um, but for more more at home stuff, um, we've got some plans for next year. Uh, as of January 2021, so like so, so last year and this year, sorry, has been like a, a scouting um, mission for us. Yeah. And as of 2021, we're looking to move to a permanent roster. So, so the fans can familiarise themselves on a regular basis. Um, you know, these are the guys that we're having on our shows. Yeah. But one match with, yeah, one match we're going to have on every show is two brand new people come in. So we're still sticking to what we set out to do: help other people. Yeah. And give and give them that um, uh, the footage, the experience that they need and still try and move ourselves forward. Yeah. It all sounds very, very exciting. And, and like we've established throughout this episode of wrestling with John is you've definitely given uh, young, really talented wrestlers uh, around the UK, a platform to demonstrate what they're capable of where, you know, they might've struggled a bit more to get a look in with other promotions, but you've, you've definitely put yourself out there as, as a group that's dedicating itself towards uh, growing homegrown talent you you could say so uh, uh well done to you and uh, everybody else at iwe um but uh, frankie that's pretty much the end of this uh interview with jonas this special episode of wrestling with jonas uh, with frankie t so frankie before we say goodbye um do you want to throw out any social media plugs any handles where my listeners can get in touch with you say hi uh, find out more about frankie t find out more about iwe uk and uh, get to see uh, what wonderful stuff you guys do over in Essex yeah um IWE you can follow on uh Instagram and Twitter at IWE Leet UK so it's IWE in capital letters and then lowercase L-I-T-E UK um Facebook you can find us at Indie Rest UK um we'll have all of our upcoming shows on there uh, our next one is in May, pending on COVID-19. Yeah. Um, but my personal, uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Frankie underscore T underscore UK. And on Facebook, you can find me at uh, Urban Goth. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Frankie, for being a, a very special guest uh, on this special interview uh, episode of Wrestling with Jonas. And um, we hope to bring you more interviews in partnership with IWE, uh, IWE UK in the coming months. So stay tuned and watch this space. And if you enjoyed this interview, then please go and check out um, all the other interviews I've done in conjunction with IWE talents such as Xander, Kevin Isaac, Maverick Blade, and of course, this one here with Frankie T, as well as my interviews in collaboration with Turbuckle TV and Coastal Championship Wrestling. And if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, please don't forget to spread the word. Tell your friends and tell your family. And don't forget to subscribe to the Wrestling with Jonas podcast so you don't miss out on a single episode. Once again, thank you very much, Frankie T, for being a special guest on Wrestling with Jonas. And thank you to everybody listening. And we'll catch up with you all again soon.